a world where you're dreaming. Is your phone on? Uh, yes. Phone police. Your phone boop, is boop, on. Phone police. You might not know it, but your phone is on. But it turns out you're not really dreaming. But the dream is your life. Waking life in a world where everything is drawn. One man hosting a show, <laughs> doing dabs. We'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit later because we have a good story to tell. We didn't even plan on having a story to tell, like a oh. mutual story, and now we kind of have one. The butane story. Thanks to our uh, misadventures, we'll call them. It's actually kind of a boring story, though. Yeah. I mean... You can't, <laughs> you can't watch Waking Life and then be like, "Oh, that story is insignificant. We shouldn't tell it because every story is significant. Okay, it's of the utmost yeah. importance that it is shared with the world." This might be the whole episode where we don't watch the movie and we just like talk the whole time and just have some kind of deep philosophical hey, without being able to listen to the movie. How could you really keep up with it? You know? Oh yeah. Well, there's subtitles. You know what's happening kind of in some scenes. If you look at a couple yeah. words, you're like, oh, this guy's talking about molecules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking molecules, man. Ugh, very scientific. One man is forced to live in a dream. Come on, let's watch a movie, get drunk and shoot the shit. Hopefully we can see that actress show her tits. And if they win an Oscar, we will talk about it too. When we get movie buzzed with you. Trivia and silly talk, what more could you really want? Movie time and getting drunk, man, we'll have I a really lot like of fun. I really like the song. Purple Rain and shit that Michael Bay has made too. We will the talk impressive about thing it is he whipped it up in like movie buzzed with you. 45 minutes for me. Yeah. Inebriating, movie rating, and we've got a cast. Movie buzzed is the best. Podcast starts now. And I really can't argue with anything that that guy said. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. Well, welcome to the show. We're going to start, even though we've already started, we're going to start officially the Movie Buzz podcast with your host, Zach, here, and a uh, special guest host, Will. Welcome back to the show. Hey. Will the Thrill Hedrick. Right. Your son got real quiet when he got official. It's not, yeah. The Thrill. I've been throwing that around. <laughs> Seems to be sticking, so get used to it. <laughs> but you do, yeah, <laughs> that, that'll work. I'll, I can, I can deal with that. Right, you just, you just start referring <laughs> so to yourself as that as well. Yeah. Be good. I have be no good. story behind it though. So uh, good. I'm gonna ask. I know it's probably oh. <laughs> the best. Uh, the good thing is I have a blanket covering the DVD player because it's humming, and uh, yeah, I forgot. You probably can't manipulate the what you might call it the uh, laser connection uh, yeah. between the. Controller the and the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the remote is that what you're talking exactly. about? Exactly, but I'm not getting a sync synchronization. I'm trying to get into waking life like vocabulary. It's all very technical. It is. All right, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> this is all a dream. All right, let's see if we can turn up the volume a little, wreck ourselves, check ourselves, play a movie. All we right. also oh no. <laughs> this is a movie about you a guy who's dreaming, right? So the whole movie's a dream, right? Yes, I want to say yes. Is that a is that a concrete enough response yeah. for you? <laughs> so you, automatically yes. you should feel ripped off. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> none of it happened. It's all a dream. Like General Hospital, it was like you know an autistic boy looking into a snow globe that yeah. had the hospital in yeah. it, and like the whole show was just the story he made up for the characters in his mind. That's so some none of total it really happened. waking life shit right there, man. You fucking cried when that bitch died. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out she was all <laughs> just a dream. <laughs> what the fuck? I don't like that word. That's what I watched an episode of Arrow. I'm catching up, and this chick's like, "This guy's like, oh, I knew you didn't. The bitch didn't have it in her, and she killed the guy." And she's like, "I don't like that word." <laughs> I was like, "That is hard ass. That's awesome." <laughs> you know, for every lady that's ever been called a bitch or anything, you know, like that's like, <laughs> yeah. totally, that was awesome. I felt I felt the power behind that. It was awesome. I don't like that word. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's bitch awesome. Bitch is a classic. You can't get rid of bitch. This is the director's children, I believe, or one of them is Lorelai Linklater. I don't know if it is his children or not, but they are related to him in some way, clearly. Oh, there's subtitles. Oh, check. I thought I was going to do that, but yeah, Dream is Destiny is what it ends up being on. They have one of those little, what is the Chinese, what, what, I don't know what I call it, Chinese, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's like origami. It's like yeah, origami. it's like the folding thing, you know, it's like pick a number. Yeah. 
pick a color. Yeah. And it said Dream is Destiny. That was her selection. It wasn't like, you will be married in a week or something. What do, you, did you ever but do you that? But you see, though, like later in the movie, he says that numbers and colors and stuff like that are all mixed up. And he was just looking at numbers right there. Right. Okay. Dream. Hmm. And they were all clear. And he also read. And he said, like, writing was messed up sometimes. This too. is weird. I like because they they did the rotoscoping on this. They like animated over the live action. Like, did they have that kid in a harness? <laughs> he was like <laughs> hanging on a car or something, or was it? I don't know. I'm very curious. I don't know. I'm gonna have an interview with Tommy Pilata. He was, I think it's pronounced Pilata. I hope so. Pilata. 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 But yeah, he was a producer on this and like a scanner darkly. You want to play a little game? It's very technical. I know. You want to play a little game, bud? Yeah. Okay. Top quiz, hot shot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, buddy. It's the new segment. It's called oh, shit. It's called Pop Quiz. Oh god. Pop quiz, hot shot. <laughs> now I'm regretting my decision. Yeah, yeah. I I'm still trying to find the clip where it's uh, Keanu with the retort, "Pop quiz, asshole." <laughs> but they don't do have I, that. Do I win anything? No, no. It's just a little oh. It's just a little trivia question. I'm going to see if you can get somewhere in the ballpark. If you do, I'll give you another hit of the the dabble. <laughs> We're gonna do it anyway, but yeah. this will be this is more incentive, <laughs> right. I guess. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm bribing it. my friend with drugs. It's a great way to live your life. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a bribe, it's a prize. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's a prize. You know how many hours this took to like you know how many hour man hours it took to like render this into animation. Like not render it, but oh. to hand draw every scene. The entire movie? The entire movie. They started animating after it was cut. I assume he didn't animate the, like all the fucking film, you know, hours. Yeah. And I assume they cut it, then he animated over it. So, yeah. Well, they did. There's a whole team at the end. It says, you know, even the Wiley Wiggins there, the star, you'd know him from like Dazed and Confused and shit. He was even one of the animators. Yeah. <laughs> all right. This is like the first fully animated independent like feature film. Oh, that's good. So. It's kind of, they all had to chip in there. The, even there but weren't yeah. like animes that were, they would, because there were a lot of animes that were fully animated feature films. But uh, it's it's independently produced. I think it's a thing like independently oh. funded or whatever. It wasn't, like there was no studio behind it. I don't know. I'll have to look that up. But uh, I'll, I'll look it over here for you. I forget. He told you me. You know, like Japanese animes like um, Akira and shit like that. It was fully animated feature film. But. Back to the back to the pop quiz asshole. Okay, uh, <laughs> how I many, think how many hours, right? Did it take to the an, animate it? I how many hours? Like, yeah, ten thousand hours. Oh, that's a lot. That's a hefty guess. It was five <laughs> five hundred. <laughs> I don't know. Wow, that was a really you. Yeah, you're giving them a lot more credit than they're due. No, but five hundred man know. hours. You know what I mean? Like, I, have, I had no idea. Like, not even the ballpark for a film that's uh, an hour and a half long. Somewhere around there, five hundred hours to make that. You know, not yeah, just I guess filming. I, I should have <laughs> considered that, like how long the movie is, yeah, and exactly. how many hours in comparison. That probably would have given me a good clue. It's good stuff, though. Yeah. You, you have participated in the second pop quiz, so congratulations. Yes, I was just trying to Did find the other one. Lose. Uh well we just kind of looked it up on the internet <laughs> we were trying to figure out what a hippo, there, there, a hippogriff nobody, nobody's won yet though nobody not like technically won, won. <laughs> I need I don't have some kind of like dun 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 dun, dun <laughs> well All I right. do right there well I don't no, feel wait, bad wait. then if everybody's lost no it's right. only been two Megan had yeah. one and we were trying to figure out. she kind of got it right like what a hippogriff was she's like it's like a horse eagle but then she was trying to throw a third animal in there oh man <laughs> I would have nailed that one she was trying to like <laughs> A Dungeon, half, a half, and a half, you know. Playing Dungeons and Dragons, I would have yeah. known that. I know exactly. Well, yeah, but we were trying to figure... The thing was, like, it's a wing, winged horse. So the wings aren't necessarily eagle wings. They're, like, yeah. horse-sized wings. He already has wings before he like fucks an eagle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and their offspring is a hippogriff. Yeah. There you go. I never got... I didn't get that far on it. I didn't get to talk about the horse and the eagle. Or the the winged horse. It's like a pegasus and an eagle having... Relations. <laughs> that has to be part of the equation, right? I assume. That would be the natural result. Okay. I love the guy, this guy in the boat car. Yeah. And I want a boat car. And I want to just pick people up and drop them off like two blocks down the street and be like, fuck you, kid. The, <laughs> You're fucked. <laughs> the guy in the back, the, that's the director there. 
That's oh, yeah. Richard Linklater, yeah. All right. Yes, he's in the he last... familiar. He's in one of the last scenes with the pinball, the pinball machine. He's the one yeah. playing pinball. That's him. Yeah. Right. You right. did. I know, I'm, I know that that's the same guy, but... It's, uh, yeah, I think they call him Rick. I didn't know he was the director. I think that's what, like, friends refer to him as. I will not call him Rick, though. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. He's like, he's like, yeah, you were in that uh, that boat car thing. <laughs> I want that. I want that. That car. is pretty cool. It reminds me of like that. There was some like Gallagher intro, <laughs> like to one of his comedy specials, and he was like rolling around in one of those fucking boat cars. I want to drive that around and pick people up, dude. Randomly. I wanted to be Gallagher for so long, or at least I thought the guy was cool. Who doesn't want to be Gall- Gallagher? Is the only person who doesn't want to be Gallagher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Linklater, like, everybody should know his shit. He did School of Rock. Like, that's one of the biggest ones he did. But there's this new movie out called Boyhood, and he fucking recorded it over, like, a 12-year period or, like, an 18-year period where, like, they just come in and film a few scenes every, like, few years and, like, watch this kid uh, grow up. <laughs> like, it was uh-huh. nuts. You know, like the kid started when he was like eight and then they ended when he was like 19 or so. Huh. <laughs> like, that'd be nuts. Yeah. You fucking Talk nuts, bruh. Mental scarring. This is, the transitions in this one are, in Slacker, they kind of just like hand off like situations. This guy's going somewhere, he intercepts someone, and then like they are at this place. And then the conversation shifts to like two other people that were at this place that they are now at, you yeah. know? But in this one, like, it kind of, it's kind of weird. Like, some of the, the little. I call them vignettes or whatever. Like, like dies or wakes up usually. Yeah. Or it just starts like a new thing starts. You're like, what is, what kind of, like yeah, the transitions, sudden, like it's real hard. All of a sudden he's talking to someone else about sudden, something completely different. The philosophy, uh, existentialism, the philosophy of despair. Like the first half of this movie isn't even about dreaming and shit. Oh, this is, yeah, this is totally like about philosophy yeah, right now. Later, does it like, is it actually more about like dreaming and lucid dreams? Because he stuff? doesn't understand, you know. This is him gathering the information of being in a dream. I guess this is him, like, traversing the dream. Starting to realize. Oh, now they're having the old teacher-student convo. Always super awkward. When you're the only one walking with the <laughs> teacher and having, like, an in-depth conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you look like you're either A, a big nerd, or B, lovers. That's <laughs> another thing, too. He doesn't even say anything. He doesn't say a lot. Right now. He's, uh, yeah, like, right now, yeah. He's, he's like, just, is he going to kiss me? Is it? Is he gonna like? I really feel like he's about to. Like, I like that guy's nose is pink, <laughs> but it's cool when he like scrunches his head. You see the f- like they animate the wrinkles like in his head. Like it's all there. It is. Yeah, <laughs> it's all smooth, and then he's like you know emoting, and his little wrinkles pop up. It's kind of cool. <laughs> but then there's like these scenes where, oh, it's a different right. scene. Never mind. Hey, let's go get some Chardonnay. Let's at go the get coffee a nice, shop. Let's go get a nice port. I could talk to you about existentialism. <laughs> mm, that's what they called me, my penis in high school. <laughs> they called me the existentialist. Sorry, that was a horrible joke. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. Why would someone call your penis the existentialist? Because <laughs> I'm only concerned with man and man's understanding <laughs> oh, <God>. of the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly why this you would call it that. Man, it would be really... Uh, be really intimidating to be in a relationship with someone like this. The ones that have like a conversation about like what language means and like, you know, yeah. our experiences, like we experience w- much more than what language can even like begin to uh, describe. Like, I like to fact, have conversations like that sometimes. <laughs> but it's like, in fact, a majority of our experiences aren't verbal, you know, like almost yeah. all of them. You don't, you don't really experience anything verbally really, unless it's someone like lying to you or something like that. So, well, know. there are other more profound things like danger and shit. That no, she, see, that's, she where, talks about the, that's where I'm cutting it off. I don't want to have any kind of intelligent conversation with anyone. No. About anything. <laughs> about nothing. That's why I don't have friends. Pretty much I don't have friends. That's why I'm single. I disagree. I've had <laughs> I've had those know, conversations with you. <laughs> I know. Whimsy philosophical. I could about. only carry that so far. And it didn't yeah. go very far. <laughs> But yeah, that's the way I present myself. I guess sometimes, you know, talking I about, mean, just talking about, talking about, talking about. I guess though, like this movie presents every moment is significant. So, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, me rambling about whatever is uh, <laughs> totally significant, man. Well, this is all. That's all I'm language. saying. It's all language. 
No, no body language involved whatsoever. But yeah, she's saying that that's you know we invented language to like not feel so isolated within ourselves to feel connected. But language also helps us reason. Tu la ru la hura. It helps us reason, and reasoning's a huge factor. Talking it out in your head. Yeah. Figuring shit out. Bam! You're intelligent being now. Congratulations. Don't dolphins talk? It's <laughs> 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 a legit- like, uh, legitimate question. <laughs> like when it's just when you because they say yeah and I say again. Yeah. When, when you <laughs> asked, I pictured in my head like a dolphin, all like, "What's Ralph, up, man?" <laughs> Ralph, <laughs> I pictured Ralph, the dolphin. quit pooping in this fucking water. How many times do I got to tell you? <laughs> Jesus Christ, Ralph! Oh, this guy, this, this guy's guy, head. This guy's head it's is bulbous. freaking. It uh, freaks me out, man. Bulbous. You know it's warping all the time. I'm yeah. Like, I remember we were having this conversation. I said we'd bring it up now, but I experienced this movie when I was, like, you know, around 18, 17, somewhere around there. Yeah. And it's, like, it's just one of the, it came out around the time, like, Fight Club came out, and, I don't know, there were quite, a, there were a decent amount of movies that were kind of, like, all about the human condition and shit, and, like, yeah. further, you know, exploration of that. Yeah, I don't know. And it just, opened your mind up. To some yeah, shit. but also like fear and loathing. I've mentioned that one too. Like that, you know, it yeah. kind of like opens your mind to a different type of world. You could go through your life, exactly, <laughs> trying to like whatever graduate high school and shit. But there's a, like there's a bigger world happening. That most people that age don't really realize how much of an impact everything has. But yeah, I always remember these movies. We would watch them when we would get fucked up. <laughs> Like, just, you know, a group of, like, five or six of us would just, like, drink beer and, yeah. like, maybe smoke some yeah. weed. And then, like, put this on and, then you know, like, it's already, like, 3 a.m. If you <laughs> but, ever try watching it tripping, you'll just give up after, yeah. like, half an hour. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, my God, this movie's uh, so this long. It's like, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just really funny because it's, you know. How about the, these walls? In the, <laughs> you know? in, the, in the grand scheme of things, like, of movies in total, this movie isn't really that long. But yeah. <laughs> if you're on that kind of, you know, and this, if the screen's warped like that, and you're just like, and it's just a movie about talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is all you gather when you're fucked up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. If you watch it, you know, not fucked up, then you actually listen to what they're saying. Yeah, like this guy, I definitely have to, you have to pay attention and deconstruct the vocabulary he's using, you know. He's talking about parallel existences. Yeah. Being able to traverse time and space. Neo-human type evolution. Yeah. Yeah, so you can be like the one. Neo. Of course. Neo. Neo. And you could I'm expand a and contract your head at will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could do it at will right now. Cuz your will. I'm expanding it's my a head. Joke. As I inhale. I'm doing it at you. As I inhale, I expand my head. <laughs> Sounds like some kind of fucking Flaming lips lyric. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking a drink. <laughs> I tried so hard not to yeah. spit the beer out of my nose. <laughs> oh, it is perfect, though. <laughs> when I inhale, I expand my head inside a daydream or something like that. It's beautiful, man. So this is, is he going to sleep now <laughs> in his dream? Yeah, so usually it transitions. He goes to sleep, he dies, or he fucking... Feels like he's dead. Yeah. Towards the end, he's really flipping out at the end. You know, he's like, I, I think, well, not flipping out. Like, he's <laughs> like, you know, he's actually, he seems more concerned than he ever has in the whole movie. Pretty I, much. He's like, I, I do want to get into like lucid dreaming, but okay, I don't want to get, get into, into that it. until the movie gets into it. Because also, there's. It just happened. The clock just the kind bo- of had the numbers that were all. Yeah, but he, th- that was like a, a, a little clue for lucid dreaming. No, uh, okay, dream. yeah. But also, you're like floating like this. That's yeah. a good clue that you're in a dream. <laughs> like, if you just start floating all you of a sudden. You'd be like, I don't normally do this. Yeah, <laughs> why am I floating? Uh, is this where they go to talk about the dream? And the guy's like, look at your hands. Or no, there's still a couple more just, like, things, <laughs> you know, that so are the, not about like, dreaming. This transition, like, it just, you know. This guy. This guy is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Except he doesn't, like, scream. Ever. I mean, it could tie together. He's talking about, you know. An outsider feeling like he's insane and not part of society and whatnot. And, like, in your dream, you're pretty much all alone. Oh, God. I keep hitting my head. He just got done <laughs> telling him, for the, the past three weeks, train myself not to scream when I catch myself on fire. <laughs> As he fills up, like, a gas tank full of gasoline. 
not of anything else. Yeah. That's that'd be a fun thing to do. Fill a gas tank, gas thing with like a fucking milk or something, and go to the gas station and then like drink out of it or something like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Freak people out a little bit, right? <laughs> it's like a hidden camera show waiting to happen. What, what are you doing? You want some? <laughs> oh no, like a little kid doing it. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If like you leave the car unattended and this like you know twelve year old comes out and picks up the gas can, and starts chugging, like smells it and starts chugging. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're inside the store just shopping or something. That'd be perfect, man. I should run a I should run a candid camera sort of thing. With kids. Fucking people. It's gotta be with kids. Fucking people's minds. <laughs> with kids. <laughs> <laughs> you have been mind fucked by a child? It's vicious. In the world. Where children are fucking minds. And your minds are being fucked by children. R.I.P. Don LaFontaine. The guy that is most well known for those movie, for those, what, like teaser trailer voiceovers. In a world where there's magic tickets and boys can go into movie screens and then hang out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. One man has that golden ticket that allows you to go into a movie and hang out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's, uh... Catches isn't himself on fire. Reminiscent of, uh... Doesn't what, even react. Wasn't that like a protest or something like that yeah. at one point? Somebody just caught himself on fire? Chinese shit. Or have those, have those photos been found to be fake? I'm trying to cause controversy on the show. Well... Dude, I have some, I'm going to tease this because this episode comes out after, but I have some late breaking TMZ type shit news that's oh, going to drop God. from Andy Milder of Weeds fame. It involves A-list celebrity Kiera Knightley. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Yeah. You're not riveted. Re- no, You're going to have to check in the next episode, man. <laughs> Am I? This is like celebrity uh, news at its finest. This is uh, like. This I just is don't like, really get into celebrity, like, you know, sort of stuff, hard copy and shit. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Movie hard. Buzz Nightly News. This just in. Andy Milder claims audacious something <laughs> about Kiara <Keira> Knightley <laughs> on the next something. Movie Buzz. <laughs> yeah, audacious claim. Claims audacious claim. We're okay. working. We fired all of our writers here at the movie buzz. Evening news. <laughs> Dude, trust me. It can't get any worse than the episode that me and Mike sat here and tried to make a dial tone. <laughs> that was some. That was some fucking riveting shit, man. I tell Audacious you what. Claims. I was like, you do the low tone. I'll do the high one. <laughs> you don't need to try and do it again. Yeah, I know. Nope. <laughs> This is uh, Ethan Hawke and Julie that, Delpy. This part, I have a little commentary on the whole like psychic revelation thing. Yeah, like the collective conscious. One of the biggest arguments for it is like, oh, everybody like invented something all at the same time, all over the planet. Right. You know what I'm saying? They but, came to the same discovery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But most modern inventions took a lot of other inventions before they could be made, like the light bulb. It was a whole bunch of people came up with the light bulb all over the world at the same time. Right. But before the light bulb can be invented, like 20 other inventions had to be invented. So the next logical step after those 20 other yeah, inventions... Yeah, like after this coil and this fucking Is the light. freaking light bulb. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I gotcha. It's it makes the, sense. Yeah, and it's the same thing <clears throat> with like... Uh, oh, but it kind of ties in to earlier with the guy was saying that like... Evolution is now occurring so fast that, like, eventually, you know, go beyond being just like humans. It's just the same technology evolves. The next, yeah, yeah it's like technology the technology is an evolution. It's yeah. the next logical step. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. So, great. I don't know what I was interjecting there. The crossword puzzle one. That one's pretty. Easy. The answer. Well, that guy. I mean, you don't even have to debate. The guy just says something that kind of is just like, <laughs> it, it makes sense. You know, it's like whatever. Yeah. Well, they, you know, that once the answers are, that's his explanation. That's the thing. Like, I understand, I could see that happening. Like, not as a coincidence, but like as a thing where the answers are out there. Yeah, exactly. But if you could explain it better, then just like, it just seems like the answers are just like, poof, just out there. What what he's trying to say, yeah, it's like other people that have done the crossword that are in the world, you know what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. are now using the words that are in the crossword in their regular speech. A day later or whatever, yeah. In their regular speech to other people, and those words spread because other people hear them, you know. 
You're like, if Alter. you haven't seen the movie, what did it? Uh, there's a study that was done, and they gave they gave a group of people crossword puzzles, yeah. and then that 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 uh, ran in the newspaper every day, and then secretly, they had given the one the day prior, the one that the no. the the, yeah, the yeah. world had already answered, yeah. but these people had not seen. They scored, scored way higher, way higher on the crossword. Well, they've also because done of that it. delay, but also. It's if it's the day prior and like it was out in the world, how how do you know they they're not crossword enthusiasts? They didn't come across it in some way, or you know what I mean? They didn't yeah, that encounter would skew this. It. Was it like, but there was a control for that too. They also had people do not. who knew that they were taking a, a day later crossword and didn't you know like if anybody's talked about the crossword, they'd be like, don't talk to me about the crossword. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a test. They're they're the control, and it was the same thing. This guy. Always fucking like captivated me. I always I remember this. There's two scenes that I specifically remember every time, and it's this guy and it's Alex Jones, the guy in the car. This guy's all, all about the conspiracy theories and shit like that. Yeah, not shit. I mean, that's what you believe. It's I mean, it's legitimate because you believe it. You know, I'm not saying you're wrong. I have <laughs> no way to pr- disprove or you know prove anything involving JFK or 9/11 or anything like that. So yeah. <laughs> you're entitled to your opinion. And it's not, you know, he doesn't have, like, crazy views, I wouldn't say. It's nothing like, you know, God caused the buildings to collapse because of our immoral ways. (laughs) Nothing like that. (laughs) (laughs) Is that the crazy line right there? Yeah, that's uh, it. But this guy, he's he's just, like, in a prison, just, like, talking about how he's going to fucking cut people's eyelids off and hold, like, cigars up to their eyes and... So they can like molten lead up the ass. So they can like watch him fucking torture. Who is he talking to? <laughs> the guards, uh, just just whoever, some old Apache shit. Whoever would care to listen. That's the Apache shit is cutting off the eyelids. Some old Apache shit. Old guy. <laughs> oh, sweet music, and we'll, I love how he's like, "We'll do it in a hospital, so they can like take care of you. You got nurses and doctors, and you know, like <laughs> we'll be checking your vitals, pumping you full of fluids." While I'm simultaneously <laughs> releasing said fluids out of other areas of your body, <laughs> blood transfusion. Well, now I just negated it by cutting a little slice out of your butt cheek. <laughs> we'll take millions of man hours <laughs> till you're almost out of your mind, but not quite. Dozens of doctors. Because I want it to last a long. Long time. It's going to be a Tijuana. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're clearly already out of your mind, so there's no breaking point for you. So, yeah, you're probably waiting for your victims to break. <laughs> there's probably... We what? should drink some rum and smoke some what? dabbles. That old drunken fart. Okay, we'll do that. Last episode, we were trying to smoke some with Megan, and we only had a little bowl, but we, we had a little adventure. We got a torch lighter, which is the proper way. Yeah. And... It took us, apparently, I would like to give a hand to whoever passed whatever legislation that made butane not easy to acquire in the state <laughs> of Indiana, because it used to be every fucking where. I don't think it's the legislation, I think it just didn't sell. Ah, uh, yeah. It was, but it was just on, like, the market. It was in know? gas stations, like yeah. pharmacies, nope, nope. They had it at Walmart, but the yeah. whole row was sold out, apparently. It probably just didn't sell, you know. So. Nope. But yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. This and is... the whole row was sold out at Walmart because they didn't, they order, have it anywhere they else. didn't order very much. You know? There was a big thing about butane because it's the holidays. Fucking butane. That's, the, that's the ticket. That's what we'll oh, say we're using yeah. it for. We're Let's using, load it up. We're using it for holiday purposes. To get high <laughs> on the holidays. <laughs> a little holiday cheer directly injected into your lungs. I, I like this the free will conversation, too. That's a good one. Maybe there is no free will. Because it's all set forth either by God, you know, who already knew how it all end up, or it's all set forth by, like, the laws of physics. But uh, then this uh, conversation all also brings, like, the devil into play as well, which yeah. is awesome because, you know, Hail Satan! But, you know, like, if there was a devil, he was created by God, and God knew what he would do. Exactly, he yeah. Shit, so I mean, the devil he knew it would happen. Well. And he knew all of the changes it would make on our will and all that. And shit. that's what I what's the I don't know what story it is. I don't, I'm referencing it though, but it's where the devil like he rebelled against God because of the the free will debate or whatever. You know, he didn't yeah. want to be like in a predestined sort of thing. Yeah. He wanted to have his own free will as an angel. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Kind of weird. But he knew he would do. I that. feel like I'm the devil. 
Like uh, he put the freaking. <laughs> Sorry, he, he put, he the, put yeah. the apple in the Garden of Eden for fucking. And I love the way he like, found, you know, and exactly. was like, "Look at this apple that is within reach. Don't eat it." And I love the way he <laughs> explain, like he explains both sides of the picture. You know, he's like, "Yeah," and then there's people say there's like, "Yeah," he's like, "There's people that say there's free will," but I say, "Hey, your brain sends electrical signals that are bound to physical laws that we are know for certain here on Earth." He's like, "Yes." Quantum mechanics says these little particles are acting in random ways, but yeah. they act in random ways that form, you know, non-chaotic well, like they systems. Also, <laughs> they also act in like multiple ways simultaneously. They act harmoniously, create, yeah. Which create multiple systems, though. Is what, I mean, if you're talking like quantumly, like in like the pre-existing state before you have knowledge of its state, you're, it, it could be two things. Yeah, but yeah. I'm talking. I was talking about like on the level that it's just like. Right here, like these atoms that are, you know, they're smaller than yeah. neutrons and protons, you know. We can't see these atoms, but they act in a certain way that influences, you They know. seem to disappear and reappear. Yeah, exactly. I like the, yeah, I'd rather be a gear in a fucking machine than, you know, <laughs> these like little <laughs> little wisps that just, you know, like go around for no fluke. reason. Fluke. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool that he explain. you know, it's like you're bound by these physical laws that we have, so. Yeah. Part of your destiny is predetermined. Like your, it's predetermined how your body has to work in order for you to live. <laughs> so this well, is the uh, one I remember. And also, like if, if the Jones. Big Bang happened in one way and it made life like it is now, and then it happened again in the same way, it would make life again exactly like it is now. You mm. know what I'm saying? Because it would all bounce around in the exact same way. Okay, I think what we need to do is get to the interview. That will end this episode, and then the next episode we will come back and finish strong. So let's do this. We would like to welcome to the Team Procreate guest line, director, producer, among other things, Tommy Pallotta. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for being on. It's been a long time coming. Since yeah. This is the first time I've recorded in like two months because I got in a car accident and broke and dislocated. I my heard. Head. Yeah. It's understandable. <laughs> We're glad that you're still here. Me too. Well, we're going to get into this. So you, you're you a credit in this movie. You are the producer, correct? Yeah, Waking Life, I was a producer and camera. That came about, I'd known Richard Linklater since Slacker. I was an actor in, in that movie. And then I went ahead and made my own independent film and directed a feature that was shot on 16 millimeter and had some success with that, but it took four years and really depleted all of my resources <laughs> and energy. And I was, it was kind of at the cusp. It was in the sort of late nineties when the sort of indie film movement really blossomed. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of felt like it was becoming a crowded space quickly. And I just wanted to do something completely different. So I made a movie called the high road. And uh, after that, I just sort of wanted to do something that not everybody could do. And uh, I met a programmer and uh, we started to do some animated shorts that would sort of marry live action and animation. So, mm -hmm. so it was really about just to film real things and then animate those little moments in life. It was really about animating things that you would never see. So this was also kind of at the time when Pixar was blowing up and, you know, the only thing that people could really knew how to do is that you can make a, a animated film that costs a hundred million dollars. Right. <laughs> and so our, our whole sort of theory was like, how can you not, how can you make animated movies for no money? And these sort of short films and experiments, Richard Linklater was aware of because we were friends and slacker. And we started talking about how to do waking life. And at the time he was also at a crossroads and had just sort of come off a big studio film called Newton boys that wasn't a great experience for him. And he wanted to kind of go back to his indie roots. Mm -hmm. So he initially started talking about how to film this movie just using uh, consumer digital uh, cameras because I was already using kind of the digital uh, video to do the shorts that, that were the underlying uh, content for the animation. And slowly the discussion evolved to, hey, shouldn't it be animated? And that's sort of how Waking Life came about. It's really bizarre to be speaking with you Movies like Waking Life, uh, Fear and Loathing came out around that time, like a three-year span, you know, and like Fight Club, like those kinds of movies right. really. I mean, that's when I was kind of 
turning into a teenager and like <laughs> opening my mind to new ideas. So waking life was like definitely yeah. this huge presence in my life. And it's just, ultimately it's just bizarre. <laughs> it's like coming full yeah. circle now. <laughs> it's always really great to hear that. And I mean, I mean that in the most sincere way when people tell me that a movie that I worked on, you know, meant something to them or opened themselves up because I grew up in rural Texas. Right. And, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, cer certain books and, and certain music and, and movies were kind of my window to the world with that made me feel not insane mm -hmm. because I felt so out of sync and out of step with, you know, my surroundings. And that was sort of a very exciting time for movies. I remember seeing Fight Club thinking like, wow, this is like a major film with a major star. Right. But it's as subversive as any film can be. But it was also that time when Pulp Fiction was coming out making over $100 million and winning Oscars and all that, you know, stuff. And it felt like that there was a paradigm shift, not only in the types of films that were being made, but also in the audience. And mm -hmm. a lot of people always forget that, that it really takes the audience support, you know, to get these films seen as well as made. Right. And it sort of felt like it was a really exciting time. And a movie like Waking Life snuck in at a time that, you know, we couldn't make that movie today, even at the same budget range. That was like a one and a half million dollar film. Mm -hmm. And at that time, no one had ever dreamt of making a computer animated feature for that low of a price, which was also, and, and no computer animated features looked anything like that as well. So it was exciting. It was almost like it, the, it premiered at the, uh, at the Sundance Film Festival at a theater that had like 800 to 1,000 people. And we were rendering till the very last minute. And the company that kind of did the final render to the, to the digital tape, we digitally projected it, um, they didn't have enough time to check it. So like when we saw it in the audience, it was the first time it had ever been projected and seen by anyone. And wow. it was such, you could wow. really feel the sort of excitement. Not only it was exciting, because I was kept on thinking like, is it going to work? Is right. it going to work? You know, <laughs> is, is it really going to be there at all? But the general sense of the audience, you could sort of feel like they'd never seen anything else like that before. And it was just so different than Pixar and so different than anything they'd seen in terms of animated features. And you could feel that sort of rush from the audience. It was wow. just, you know, something that you're lucky to experience that once in life. That's very cool. Rotoscoping is the animation that you're speaking of, I assume. It's just the process of animating over live <clears throat> action or... Yeah, I mean, rotoscoping is one of the oldest animated forms. It, it started almost at the beginning of animation. Some of the earliest animated films were, were rotoscope. And even some of the early Walt Disney films had rotoscoping within them. So it started in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't anything new. It was, in fact, quite old. But it was just kind of, it was sort of forgotten. And in the animation world, rotoscoping is kind of looked down upon. I didn't even know this at first. Right, like the it's technical... It's considered not real animation. It's sort of uh, hmm. like cheating, you know? Like the art of, you know, animation, even by definition, if you go, I guess, to the Latin roots, it's like to bring to life. Um, and so, like, if you're doing that the, in the animated world, it's sort of like motion capture. It's sort of like you're not really bringing it to life. You're just using that as, you know, a base for it. And I guess because I didn't have a background in animation at all, mm -hmm. it never even occurred to me that there was a right way or a wrong way to do animation. <laughs> and I, I never, I never studied film either. So, I mean, I guess I approached everything as sort of a fan, like, does it look cool? Mm -hmm. You know, does it fit the story? And it was only like afterwards that I sort of realized that there was a real sort of pushback in the animation community to this style. You're talking about like Pixar being like a more, I guess, a cleaner animation, I guess you'd call it or something. But there was all these stories about, you know, to Toy Story taking whatever, like, months and months to render and, like, rooms of supercomputers and whatnot. So I was kind of curious how tedious the process of rotoscoping is. Well, I mean, I would say, you know, it, it started out very simple and and really was, it started out, you know, with a really small team and, and, and the objective was to do it cheap and, and fast. And Waking Life was sort of a really magical experience you know like if every movie can be like that then i would be happy if we can sort of fast forward to scanner darkly yeah um that's sort of the flip side to this this was sort of a nightmare 
process. And I would say that in terms of the animation, it took about 500 man hours to do every minute. Um, every minute? You know, give or take. And, and it took a huge staff of people with a lot of, you know, drama and difficulty in order to get that movie made in, you know, 18 months, probably 50 people. You know, it, it was sort of went against everything with, you know, how we started in the first place. But Waking Life was much simpler. The, and the style was a lot easier. Uh, there's very little direction. Like, because the live action creates sort of the, the continuity between that, mm -hmm. um, we were able to hire visual artists who didn't really have um, some of them didn't even have any animation experience, but the software was so easy for them to use as a tool that they were able to bring their sort of artistic vision to that, bring it to life and interpret these scenes that were already there. So we really encourage people to use their sort of vision in each uh, scene. Very cool. And, yeah. uh, and that just sort of made it go faster. And it was just sort of newer, faster, leaner. And it was the kind of story it was episodic um, that it didn't, there didn't have to be a visual continuity to it. So that it also freed up a bunch of um, time and resources as well. I think it took about like a core group of people, like 12 people, you know, less than a year mm -hmm. to make Wake in Life. In terms of the animation, that doesn't include, you know, of course, the writing, the shooting, the casting, the, you know, the editing of the live action. The thing about the rotoscoping is that you're really making at least two films. You're doing a live action feature, and then you're bringing it into the post-production process and animating that live action feature. So in terms of the animation, some characters, I mean, specifically in this movie, some characters, um, when, uh, what's his, what's, uh, sorry, I just lost my, uh, Wiley Wiggins, that's his name. Yeah. <laughs> Took me a minute. He's having these, like, don't different... Think, don't, think, the... don't think he has a name in the movie, right? Right, just... right. Dreamer, right? Lost. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when he's exploring these different areas in the movie he's having conversations pretty much one-on-one -on -one, typically conversations <clears throat> with people and i'm just curious why some of them are animated i don't know it seems more like simplistic i guess and then others look like mm -hmm. you know living port i mean it looks like something you'd see like george george washington or something i mean <laughs> right i'm just really curious about this whole process in general well i mean the approach was a uh... The easy way to think about it is that each scene was handled by a different artist and sort of it was done in their style. Now we had, there was help within that. And um, usually one person just didn't do it alone, but then if somebody else was helping them, then they would sort of do it in their style. And the process was that we would sort of cast each scene the same way that you would with an actor, but with sort of an artistic vision. Mm -hmm. And so we would have somebody do, a test still, maybe a couple of people, and then we'd look at that and then sort of talk to them and then sort of say, okay, this will be your lead for this scene. And that's sort of how that happened. So really we thought about it in terms of style, like we really encouraged people to use their style. So there was no overall direction. It really, each scene came from um, a, an artistic vision of a, you know, a person. Mm -hmm. I think, different person. personally to me, I think it adds more to like the dream state sort of idea of the movie that everything's I mean the hair color like shifts and like the wrinkles and people's faces show up and disappear and like <laughs> it's really nuanced so yeah <laughs> um, well it's also it's great it's great when people are able to to inject and infuse their own personal vision into that you know and like right. in animation you rarely get that opportunity and animation is just really hard work and and I think that if you know, a lot of times there's sort of a consistency of style that's just um, difficult to maintain. And in this case, you know, people were freed up from that. And I think that you sort of feel that liveliness and that freedom within it. And it was a story that sort of really was able to use that to its advantage. I mean, whenever you're, you're talking about sort of visual style, it always has to serve the story. It has to work in concert with that. And, and luckily, you know, the sort of, in some ways, waking life, felt very experimental when we were making it. And I look back at it, you know, today, how, how long ago was that? 10 plus years, right? 12, 15, I don't know. I, we, were, we were filming it in 99. It came mm -hmm. out in 2001. So I, that tells you a little bit how, you know, the process of filming it and then editing it <laughs> and then the animation part of it. I think it premiered January 2001 and then it was released theatrically later on that year. So 
everybody kind of knew and everybody kind of felt like that they were getting away with something and, and, and we were somewhat aware of it. You know, we knew that we were making something that we may never get a chance to again, right. you know, with really little, little oversight or, you know, corporate pressure or responsibility it really was an independent film. We were lucky enough to have, you know, partners who gave us enough resources to make the film that, that we wanted to make and took a risk on that. In terms of your career, you've done, you've done anime, you've done stuff for like, MTV, uh, Waking Life, you talked mm-hmm. about a scanner darkly. You've done some of your own stuff as well, which we'll get into later. But from what it sounds like, I mean, it's a lot of work that you're putting into what you're doing. And it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick here, obviously, but it's not, <laughs> it's not necessarily like financially viable or something. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not like yeah. you're breaking the bank here. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you know, why you do what you do. Uh, do you have uh, I mean, like some kind of yeah. philosophy, so to speak, or, you know? I don't, I, I, no. I mean, I, I think I'm super lucky, first of all. And I think that, the, you know, being a filmmaker is a lot like, you know, being an actor and stuff like that. There's a top echelon. There's a very small percentage who makes the majority of, of everything else. And I've been very lucky that I've made a living, you know, making what I make, which I'm very grateful for that. And you know, there's a lot of people who make movies who don't really or can't really sustain a livelihood mm-hmm. from that. And I've been I've been fortunate to be able to, to do that. I mean, it's like common sense. I think from the very beginning, um, <laughs> film wasn't like a super deep passion of mine. I, did, I wasn't like I read the interviews and people are always like, I got to make movies. And I always knew that when I was a kid right. and stuff like that. It was sort of something that seemed interesting and something that very early on uh, – you know, I made something and people responded to it. And then I made something for work for hire. And most of my life, I've been able to either make money from what I'm doing, or I could supplement my income from doing other things to continue to do what I'm doing. And that's just sort of common sense, right? Everybody has to make a living. And I always tried to pick the things that would allow me to make what I want to make and not hate. It never really felt like a job to me. I don't know if that's an- answering the question. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? Is. I forgot. <clears throat> like, just, how do you, what, 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 is, what was the question? Uh, well, like I said, it's kind of like, um, do you have like a, so, so why I do guess I like do a, what a I full, do? Yeah. That's, why do you do what thing? Well, that, but also, yeah. do you, when you go into projects, do you go into them, you know, like I was trying, I was trying to say it, it's, it's somewhat clear just from my impressions that you're not getting into this to, you know, for mo- for money's sake. I'm not opposed to money. I mean, well, yeah, I, I'm, no, I mean, I'm like kind of said, following, really... <laughs> I think I'm following my instinct mm-hmm. and I'm hoping that it's all going to work out some way. You know, I mean, I live, I live in LA now and I don't, LA is a tough town and I, and I think it's tough to make a living um, anywhere. And I think as the economy has gotten worse over the last couple of years, it's also affected the entertainment industry as well. And it also, it has its ups and downs, you know, I mean, they call it the feast and famine industry. And certainly that's been my experience as well. And, you know, for much of my career, I was like single without a child. Now, now that's different. Mm-hmm. I have a family. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just sort of live within your means too. So I think I, I've always gravitated toward things that I really believed in because I don't think I had the, I don't think I have the, confidence to do things that I don't really believe in. Mm-hmm. So it has less to do about money and more to do about a comfort level of where I'm in. And, you know, choose your collaborators well. I mean, I think a lot of it is luck. I mean, Richard Linklater not only is, you know, a super important and incredible filmmaker, but he's a good friend of mine and he's a pleasure to work with. Mm-hmm. And that helps. <laughs> you know, like it, <laughs> yeah, I, if you take that out of the equation, you know, we might not be, we probably wouldn't be talking right now. So no, I, to- um, I totally worded that it, question strangely. Yeah, it, I think it's, a combination, <laughs> it's a combination of following instincts, dumb luck and uh, persistence. Nice. Yeah, exactly. See, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't trying to demean you in any way whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take it that way. No, I just, from our conversations, I just gather that you're, you know, you go into projects that, like you said, interest you, that you're comfortable with, and, you know, it, it just doesn't seem like you're willing to compromise that in order to, you know, 
work on like yeah. fucking Michael Bay film or something. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I wouldn't know how to do that. Right. And you know what? There's comp- <laughs> there's compromise on every single project, mm-hmm. um, no matter what. So I think my whole attitude is it better be a seed of a very strong idea. It should be a passion that you're really willing to stick with because it's not easy. Making movies is not an easy thing to do. Telling stories to you know an audience is somewhat of a privilege, and it's a difficult craft. Wonderful. And again, this, it's, I've never really taken it for granted, and I feel like I'm still learning with every single project. And I keep on wondering 15 years later, like, when am I going to get the hang of this? <laughs> um, the very core sort of impulse is always to connect with other people. You know, it's to tell a story that there's something that you want to see yourself and something that you want other people to see and, you know, something that you want to release in the world. That sort of act of creation is, is a powerful thing. And, and it's, it's seductive and it's, it's fun. What, what a beautiful answer as opposed to an awful, <laughs> <laughs> an awfully worded question. I'm not quite as elo- eloquent, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move on in your career. But one last thing about Waking Life, I was asked to ask you personally if this movie should ever be watched sober. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to watch. I don't think it's a good movie to watch stoned, and definitely not a good movie to watch drunk, and probably difficult movie to watch under hallucinogens or any other drug. I mean, there's a lot of talking, right? Yes. And, (laughs) um, you know, I've partaken plenty in my life, but I've always sort of separated that as sort of like my relaxing mode as opposed to my work mode. Right. And um, these films, I think, have a sense of you know, a stoner-like quality and logic to them. But um, I think they're made in a way that's challenging to the the people who are making it, you know, to the filmmakers as well as the audience too. So I don't know. I mean, I think like, <laughs> I think you can do almost anything stoned, you know, I mean, that's kind of the good thing. But I mean, it's like, it can't, could you pay attention the entire time? Hi, as a kite. I don't know, maybe eat a brownie or something like that. <laughs> that would be interesting. That was my uh, my takeaway when, some, when they asked me the question, because I was thinking when I did try to experience this movie the first couple of times, I, I believe I was under the influence of marijuana, but the first five times I tried to watch it, I didn't make it all the way through, you know, when I was... Right. <laughs> and you know what? That's not a bad thing either. I mean, the movie was sort of like conceived to not have to be like a full cinema experience that takes all your attention. I mean, I think especially at the, at the time, again, going back to the late nineties, the DVDs were a big deal and it was really before YouTube and all this other stuff, but it kind of, it was a natural progression to that where you could sort of not, you can watch things in terms of chapters and, and bits. And then of course, YouTube and everything like, and these scenes, they break out to like three minute scenes. It's like a perfect, Thing. And I remember when Fox Searchlight was distributing it, I sort of said, like, well, why don't you just stream a different scene every single day, you right. know? And that would sort of get away – that would sort of get across this idea that there are different styles. You know, it's episodic and all that stuff. I th- that was a little bit too progressive for them at that time, but it's certainly <laughs> what they would do today. Right? Oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so it's, it's in a way, it's kind of a perfect YouTube movie where you can just sort of take these scenes and they can work as sort of standalones as well. And you can watch it as a film. So I think that, you know, that was something Linklater and I spoke about while we were making it, you know, that it didn't have to be this the, the normal sit-down, three-act structure. This is a perfect transition. And one, <laughs> in one of the scenes in particular, uh, one of the characters is in a bar telling this bartender the story about him, you know, having to kill a guy trying to rob him while he was working at a gas station. Right. Uh, and this is... Stephen Prince. Stephen Prince, yes. He's the... Focus of originally is a it was like a Lost Scorsese film. It was a documentary called American Boy, and it was basically right. this guy sitting around on a couch, you know, hanging out with his friends. Like <laughs> he felt like he, the best is when he, he walks in and wrestles like a full grown man for a good like you know five minutes straight. <laughs> right. But you had a chance to actually feature him in a documentary that you did in two thousand nine, American Prince. It just it seems like it's kind of poignant, you know, with the themes of waking life that. You know, even coincidences, even though they appear random, they have significance. So I was kind of curious, 
for my audience, I guess, because I've read the story, but how did you meet Stephen and decide to feature him in this documentary? I met Stephen before Waking Life, and he I met a, a friend of mine was having some uh, construction done on her house, mm-hmm. and uh, she said the guy doing it was, um, you know, used to be a producer for Scorsese, and I didn't believe it at all. And and I'd happen I'd happen to see American Boy at the University of Texas. Um, I didn't study film, but I would go to the film screenings that they would have every night for the film students, and they showed like three Scorsese shorts. The um, the Big Shave, American Boy, and um, the one with his parents. I forget the name of it. Oh, there's a recipe of his mom's spaghetti sauce at the end. Right. <laughs> um, and and I, I recognized him, and he also plays Easy Andy in Taxi Driver. Mm-hmm. And I recognized him immediately, and I was like, oh, I've seen you know American Boy, and he was sort of like very menacing. He comes <laughs> towards me. He's like, where did you see it? No one's <laughs> supposed to see that. Um, and we sort of started talking after that, and he turned out to be a really great guy and, and, and somewhat of a mentor. Right. So like when we're casting for Waking Life, I thought, well, you know, it'd be funny to have Stephen Prince in there. And of course that, that really worked out. And then um, after Scanner Darkly, uh, it was just such a big production and such, you know, a, a difficult one. And these, these films take so many years to make. I sort of had it in my mind that I wanted to do something that, that was sort of the opposite of that, you know, like mm-hmm. I didn't want to have to get money from anyone. I didn't want to have permission. I didn't want to have to, you know, look for validation from film festivals or distributors or anything like that. So I thought, why don't, you know, like musicians are great because if they do an album, then they can kind of do a B side, you know, or something like that, like a little bit more fun experimental. Mm-hmm. And at that time it was sort of the rise of BitTorrent. And um, on one hand you could say like, Oh, you know, piracy is theft and all that stuff. And I, I really, I don't really buy that argument. Um, in the same way, I think that it just sort of changes another paradigm in the same way that if you record a song off the radio, that's not theft, you know? I mean, theft is really when somebody loses something, and I just feel at the right. digital age, it's something different than that. And it also allowed movies to be seen that couldn't normally be seen. So with Waking Life, it came out, it was by no means a hit or or widely seen. And then I a couple of years after the release, it started to get, I, more and more people started talking about it. And then, you know, I've traveled to different festivals and um, go to different parts of the world and and places that it didn't ever have distribution, people were talking about it. And I was like, well, where did you hear about this? You know, and they're all like, downloaded it, man, BitTorrent and stuff. And I just sort of thought that that's interesting. You know, like it's somehow this movie that people would have never have heard of now is sort of gaining an audience. Um, and it seems like it's a, a paradigm shift that is that is, shouldn't be so dismissed by you know studios and stuff in much the same way that like YouTube is probably the biggest aggregator of you know copyrighted content. Right. Oh yeah. Um, and so I was interested in that as a form of distribution. So I thought, well, if, if I make a movie with my own money, then I can do whatever I want to with it. Then I can release it on BitTorrent. I'll pirate my own film. And see what that happens. And so I did that with Stephen Prince. You know, really, I did a lot of research. We talked a lot. We had fun. We were friends. So the research part of it was fun. And then when it came down to actually shooting it, we shot it really in half a day. You know, and then I had nice. a friend of mine who's an editor, and he sort of, you know, did it. So, like, it was made for almost nothing. And then the experiment was, if we do release it via BitTorrent, will it affect festivals? You know, will it affect people's perception of it? And... I kind of suspected that it would be a positive thing. And at that time it was right. Um, yeah, it to a lot of festivals. I think within the first week it was downloaded in over a hundred countries, you know, tens of thousands of people downloaded it, you know, shared it in this other way. That's really hard to quantify, but it created a, you know, it had a massive impact and it just sort of taught me that there is a different paradigm shift. You don't have to have a big distributor to make a connection with an audience. You know, if you have something to say, there are ways to get it out where people will listen and it's not for every single movie, but it certainly is an interesting way to think about it. And it also, it was cathartic for me to do something that didn't have all the pressures of marketing and, and, you know, people investing in it and, and things like that. So it's just like this, like this show. I mean, you know, it used to be like you would need to ha- you know, go to school for broadcast journalism probably. And like, 
know how to run a, a giant mixing board and whatnot, and like, <laughs> I have this eight, eight channel mixer, you know, and there's people in like China and uh, like England and France that download the show. So it's very, <laughs> like you said, the paradigm yeah. shift is like, it's, it's too extreme now. I mean, everybody has a podcast and everybody has a YouTube channel and everybody has, you know, <laughs> they film documentaries and right. the access is just insane. You know, like with the access comes the ability to like distribute. Right. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely a glut of content, but you know, as always, the hard part isn't really making stuff. The hard part is knowing what to make, you know, like mm-hmm. it's a blank page and it sort of comes, you know, like what do you have to say? And in that sense, I always feel that, intent is difficult to fake. Um, People, I think, respond to, you know, especially at the level that we're talking about when it's not a big extravagant, you know, there's like what, what Hollywood now, they're big events. And it's really about showing you something that no one else can do, you know, like special effects that nobody else can do, um, making it a big you know, marketing effect. It's really just about that. Like I went and saw this thing on the opening weekend, like everybody else and Los Angeles got destroyed once again, you know, <laughs> um, but what people are responding to and what they're watching at home are like honest portraits of people. So they, they go to the movies for the big event because think about it. The ticket sales are more, the concessions are a lot. If you have kids, you got to get a babysitter. Like you're not, I'm not getting out the door for under a hundred dollars anymore to go see something that's probably going to suck. Right. Right. Or I can sit at home (laughs) and watch Netflix. And what do I want to watch when I sit some, when I'm at home, it's not those big event things. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking for an experience that somehow reflects the human condition. You know, it's something that I can identify with something that's going to move me in a way. And, you know, if you, like now documentaries have a huge life on Netflix. I have one coming out in January called Last Hijack that'll be uh, hitting Netflix too. How's that for a nice segue? That's awesome. That's a good plug there. <laughs> Man, BitTorrent piracy is killing the industry even though they're making like $300 million for Iron Man 12, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, that's not what's killing the industry. In fact, there, there are plenty of examples of movies that, that were uh, pirated before that, that were... Um, before they came out in America and then they came out and they ended up doing better because of the buzz that the piracy caused. You've gotten into, this is, it kind of goes along with, I guess like the, the distribution side of, you know, internet and social media and things of that nature. You're, you've, you've gotten involved in, it's called transmedia. If you could explain what that is, but you're, this project, the last one, I think you did the collapses. It seems like, like this huge undertaking there's like a main page that has like a movie playing and then you can like scroll to the right and there's a map that like updates what's happening as the movie progresses to certain points. And then, you know, you can right. go to the right and there's like character bios and like, it's just really intense. <laughs> yeah. Again, again, it's, it's sort of experimental. And I mean, I guess I'm, I'm cursed and fortunate. I've been um, uh, diagnosed with ADD. And in a way I think that that's sort of the postmodern malaise. Mm-hmm. Everybody, seems to be on their second screen right now. And, um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to be watching TV and surfing the net at the same time or, you know, checking their phone and and all that other stuff. So this was really, um, there was a a documentary for Dutch uh, television shows. It was a traditional television documentary, but the audience was very old for that. And they wanted to sort of get the same, it's about the, you know, uh, transition between fossil fuels and alternative energy. Mm -hmm. They wanted to reach a younger audience. So again, there sort of an, was an opportunity to do something very experimental, and um, we just sort of took advantage of that and sort of combined animation with live action, you know, gaming with uh, documentary, and just sort of put it all together in a blender to see what was happening. Happening, and then there's another project that I did. Um, so that one you can go to collapses c o l l a p s u s dot com, and then another one I did was last hijack dot com. And that was a feature film as well as an interactive documentary. And again, when making the feature film, uh, there are certain things that you have to adhere to, to, you know, sort of the film audience and the, and the audience's expectations. And the interactive portion of it is great because then it allows you the ability to experiment more and show the things that um, maybe don't fit in a sort of feature 
you know, uh, traditional narrative structure of, of, of a 90 minute sit down experience, but are still just as much, still just as interesting. And in some ways I sort of think about like the footnotes, like when you read the book, sometimes I love the postmodern literature where the footnotes overtake the actual text. I think that interactive forms of storytelling are some of the most exciting stuff. And like now I grew up seeing experimental films from like the sixties and the seventies. I think like, it's not, you know, people who are doing stuff right now that are experimental aren't necessarily doing it in film. It's, it's in these new interactive forms. Yeah. It was like, a I was doing research for the show and I was trying to interact with these webs. It was just like, it's so much, it's perfect <laughs> for this age of technology. Like it's just <laughs> yeah. like you make the ADHD sort of a uh, seg- comparison and it was, it was pretty spot on. I mean, let's face it. Most people are watching movies on their tablets or phones or, or, you know, computer screens anyway. Like my daughter, like, she goes up to a TV screen and she touches it and it doesn't do anything and she completely dismisses it. <laughs> like, if it's not interactive, it's like it doesn't, it's not even real to her, you know? Yeah. No, that's how much, yeah. Oops. We're going to get <clears throat> cutesy on the show. My nephew's like that. He has like a, they bought him a tablet and he's three years old and he's just like, you know, <laughs> that gets like taken yeah, they're away. Be- they're, they're better at it than, than I am. Yeah. I know. We're getting old, man. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we gotta go with the times. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> well, I believe that about wraps it up for the show. Actually, on that depressing note, we're old. We're gonna die. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> we're old. Everyone's bypassing us, and we just have to complain. Yeah. All right, man. Enjoy the rest okay. of your night. Bye. Later on. It's time for movie buzz. It is time for movie buzz. Tell your mom, your sister, and your cuz it's time for movie buzz. Here comes your host, Zach, carrying a six pack. Come on over, enjoy the fun. It's time for movie buzz. Yeah, come on over, enjoy the fun. It's time for movie buzz.